good to remind ourselves and to still our hearts of what it's all about. He is real. He is good. He is great. He hears. He answers. And uh, I just know that uh, for some of you here today, many of you, God has already been speaking to you and I trust that uh, my thoughts in this message will be helpful as uh, we share together. Um, we don't want to just be religious, do we? We, we want to be authentically spiritual. And uh, this theme of who we're listening to, Paul writes to his young protege, Timothy, and he writes two letters, and he's pouring out his heart and shares with them, saying, this son, you're the pastor of a church. In fact, the largest church in the New Testament was the church in Ephesus. And he's saying there's lots of voices that are speaking, voices from the world, voices from the community, voices from your social context that are speaking to you to try and drive you away from leading and helping the people in Ephesus to really live the Christian life. And so uh, uh, my thoughts today are, are geared on, are we just religious or are, are we committed to living authentically? Um, there's a big difference between being religious and living authentically as, as Christians. You know, we have one of our values as a church, and if you look at, there's somewhere around in the foyer outside there, the very first value, in fact, our, our, our values that we identified, uh, we didn't make them up, it's like who we are. It's more than just our beliefs, our theology, it's what do we really value. Uh, we've summarised them in six words, six sentences, six paragraphs. And the first word is authenticity. Authenticity, the very first one. And this is what we say. We seek, Christian Family Centre, our Christian Family Centre churches, we seek to maintain an authentic and growing personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about being real with Jesus. Isn't that great? That's what we're on about. We're not just trying to be religious. And we outwork this by sincerely expressing our personal worship and our collective worship of Jesus as prescribed in the scriptures. In all that we do, in our personal walk with him, our worship, our collective worship, we try and stick with the pattern of scriptures. We outwork this by serving Jesus in a manner that's creative, relevant, contemporary, and uh, while always remaining true to our biblical foundations. We believe in being modern and contemporary and relevant to where we're at, but never shifting from our central biblical beliefs. So we want to be authentic. And Paul, when he writes to, to Timothy, he is sharing this. Why did he write? Well, in chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, he says this. This is his purpose, his big concern. Number one concern. Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves. How they ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God. And notice this, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Because there were errors in Ephesus. Ephesus was, I think, the third largest city in the Greek world, Greek Roman world. Rome, Alexandria, and uh, Ephesus. And Ephesus, I've been to Ephesus, they've dug it up on the coast of, of Turkey. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a bit like Sydney is to New South Wales, the whole of modern day Turkey. Ephesus was the, the major centre. And I think it had a population of uh, three to 400,000 people. But the, the central feature of Ephesus was the worship of, of Diana. It was a cult, the Diana cult, or in the Greek we say Artemis. And uh, this was a, a huge, a bit like what Mecca is to Muslims and Rome is to Catholics. Uh, so Ephesus was the worship of Artemis. Now to show you how, how important this is, you when you read the book of Acts, uh, there was a riot that took place in Ephesus as Paul is leading people to Christ because a lot of people who were silversmiths uh, rioted. 
they had to stop work making because they, were, they used to make little icons uh, of, the, of the deity, the, this fertility goddess. And if you see any, you can download it, you see any, any statues of, the, of Diana, she's kind of a statue, she's got about a hundred breasts and it, she's a fertility goddess. And to do with, with you know, worshipping, uh, you know, crops and, and uh, making sure that everything is, is functioning, but also in it, was a huge amount of immorality that occurred in Ephesus. And so the temple of Diana was one of the wonders of the world. To show you how big it was, if you've seen, how many have been to Athens to see the Parthenon on the Acropolis? It's fantastic, I mean like, you're awestruck this thing was put up in 440 BC and it's still up there, you know, no cement or anything, you're awestruck. The temple of Diana was five times the size of it. It's massive. So the industry of the, that community was built on idolatrous worship. And so one of the issues that happened in the Ephesus church is the women who were the priestesses, who were the, the followers of the cult, were incredibly strong and uh, quite... Whether anti-men's the right word, it was a woman's show, but they were very aggressive and, uh, and there was a lot of immorality and a lot of fighting that took place. So a lot of these girls got saved. And so when Paul writes to Timothy, some people don't understand this, when he talks about women being silent, come on, be quiet and you know, be submissive and all that stuff, he's not actually saying anything about women in ministry, women in government. He's actually saying, for goodness sake, can we not have the worship of Diana infiltrating the life of the church? Come on, everyone's got to be in order. A bit like in Corinth, there's the other scripture passage where he talks about women uh, Corinth also, the name Corinthian, in fact, you could say the name is immorality. So in Greek, if you're a Corinthian, it means you're an immoral person. Because Corinth was a foul city. And if you go to the Acro Corinth, outside of been to Corinth, it was a, a, a worship of an immoral deity. And there was uh, prostitution, temple prostitution, and there were thousands of girls. So Corinth was a really messed up place. And there was a lot of immorality. When you read the letters, so when Paul gives an instruction about, hey, come on, you girls, get in control. Again, he's got the issue. So we've got to understand culture. Because some people use these two passages in Corinth and Timothy and say, oh, therefore, women shouldn't say anything in the church. So what are you doing up here leading us and, and preaching and, and praying? Hey, the Bible is full of examples of women apostles, women pastors. In 1 Corinthians 11, they prophesy. Philip had three daughters, prophets and, and, and preachers. And so there's a whole pile of, of scriptures. Like the first, when the resurrection occurred, who were the first people to hear the message of the gospel, to see Jesus? It was women. So it's a new creation. In this new creation order, the old creation under Judaism, it was a male show. So the new creation, the resurrection story, women are the first ones to hear the gospel and they're the first ones to proclaim it. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit falls on people, on men and women, young and old, Paul says in Galatians 3, there's no gender barriers, no age barriers, no, no racial barriers. We're all one in Christ. So the scriptures are very clear. So when you read Timothy in 1 Corinthians and you see these passages that seem to, to read like, at a superficial reading, Paul's got an issue with women. He doesn't actually, he loves women. He's got an issue with disorder, with cultic tendencies that were coming into the church. And so people would just interfere. You imagine if, um, let's pick on somebody who's nice and, and temperate, Tracy and, and Pastor Jill, if, if I'm speaking and she's getting up and going, hey, yeah, I don't like what you're having to say and, and, uh, and interjecting and, inter and then she's, she's, her husband's there and she's saying, you're going to tell him to stop. It was real, it was real kind of in your face stuff. And so he's trying to bring order in it. So that's one issue he deals with in, uh, to the Ephesian church because the local context of Ephesus and Corinth was the cultic worship and huge amounts of immorality. The other issues were heresies. For example, um, what I call the, uh, I've nicknamed them the three heresies, the higher knowledge party, the higher law party, and the higher freedom party. So the higher um, knowledge party is saying, hey, Jesus is not enough. You've got you to have angels speak to you. You've got to visit heaven and have this different levels of communication with God. So you getting saved and being introduced to the Father through Jesus, that's just kid stuff. That's for Sunday school. That's for the youth. 
Now we're here. There's more. We've got to add to Jesus. Paul says he king hits that like in all of his letters, and also in Ephesus. So there were the Gnostics, we call them the higher knowledge people. And then there's also the, the higher legal people and uh, the higher law people saying, well, Jesus is okay, but Moses is more important. So therefore, we've got to marry the Old Testament and New Testament together and the 370 regulations that regulate behaviour we've got to employ. And Paul says, give me a break. This, it's... it's it's about right living under Jesus. He says, no, 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 the Judaizers are not correct either. So he's, he's, he's encouraging Timothy about the Artemis cult, the higher knowledge party, the higher law party, and also the higher freedom party. They say, now, grace, grace, grace means I can do what I want. I can sin to my heart's content, and there is unlimited forgiveness, and I can live like, I can say I'm a Christian, but I can live like a dog. And he says, no, 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 no. If, you, if you're a Christian... And Christ has forgiven you and his presence has come into your life. He then empowers you to be able to overcome the old habit patterns of the previous life through now the Holy Spirit. So, so Paul is very clear in his letters. He combats these heresies. He combats these issues. And, and that's why um, in this, he says, look at that scripture again. He says, what really counts is how you live. How you ought to conduct yourself in God's household. Forget about these cults. Forget about the higher knowledge party. Get rid of them, the higher law party, the higher freedom party. How you ought to conduct yourself in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Jesus is the truth. And the church must reflect his truth, not all these other truths that are heresies. And so, so Paul tells Timothy, let's get really practical, son, about Christian living. In Jesus Church and which is to be known as a truthful community of people who will follow the master's example so what does a Christ-like godly righteous lifestyle look like summarize it okay like as, I, as I'm reading 1 and 2 Timothy there's one one verse that sticks out really clearly beautiful verse 1 Timothy 4 this is a trustworthy saying he says this is a trustworthy saying about five times in, in, in the letter of the Timothy interesting just want to emphasize it. That deserves full acceptance. So he's emphasizing it. That is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God. He is totally Christ-centered. He's totally about people connecting with Christ. He's totally about people responding to Christ, finding their hope in him, putting their faith in him, believing him. He goes, because we have put our hope in the living God who is the savior of all people, especially those who believe. Now, command and teach these things. He goes, Timothy, you're a young man in your early 30s or such, but I command you. And, and you command the people. Get them in order. Teach them. Get rid of these heretics and, and, and blow away these false beliefs with truth. He says, command and teach these things. And don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. And, uh, and that can be difficult. I was 24 when I became the, the senior minister of the church here. And thankfully, most people were around my age. But there were a few who were really old they were in their 40s. And like Johnny Van and others, and, and kind of we looked up to them as our father figures, and they seemed so old. But, you know, when you have older people around, and you're 24, and you're preaching about marriage, and you've only been married six months, they're going, yeah, sure. Or well, you just had your first child, and you're giving a lecture on how to raise teenagers, they're going, yeah, sure. So I stayed away from those subjects until I actually proved it in my own life. So I was smart enough to know, don't preach what you haven't been practicing. But still having older people around can be intimidating. Now I'm one of the oldest ones here, so I'm not intimidated by you at all. I am by Meg Mitchell if she's here. She's intimidating. And a few of the others. I won't mention these old girls. They're fantastic. But... Um, so he is saying to us here, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example. And this is what he says, for, for the believers, what? In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Those who have been declared righteous by God, in other words, given a right standing with God through, through the grace and mercy of Jesus, will naturally live a life that displays this new and real relationship with Jesus. 
authentic Christian conduct. And he lists these things down. And I've listed them down here. And what I thought I would do is get a verse from Ephesians because remember, Timothy's the pastor of the Ephesian church. And then Paul writes to the Ephesians as well. So for every point I've made here, I've put a key verse from Ephesians, which is my favorite New Testament letter. He says, first of all, in my speech, set an example in what I say. In what I say. This is a great verse for your children to memorise, parents. In fact, it should be the first one they memorise, I reckon, particularly when they go to school and they pick up some words that you don't use at home. Like my daughter, Stephanie, when she went to reception, is she here today? Oh, she is. Oh, but be careful what I say. Okay, yeah, like... <laughs> my beautiful little girl, she came home and she uttered the swear word. And she didn't know what she was saying. She just said something... Wow, this beautiful little creature. So I promptly found a scripture that they should memorize so they could, and this is the one, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may, be, that it may benefit those who listen. Only helpful and beneficial words, please. This is what Paul says. If you're going to set an example in your speech, be helpful to people with your words and, and words that will benefit them. You see, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If your heart has been changed, it will affect your speech. So some people say, oh, well, I didn't mean to say that. And I say, well, actually you did. Well, you just slipped out. No, it didn't. It's been festering in your heart. And the cauldrons, then all of a sudden, in the right second, then out it comes. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. And so you put enough pressure on a person, or get them in a particular situation, and out will come some things you think, heck, where'd that come from? Sometimes you want to grab those words and put them back in, don't you? Whoa! But it reveals the condition of our hearts. And so... I know for me, when I came to Christ as, as a 17-year-old, I mean, I was a shocking swearer. I, can't believe, I, just, I look back now and then, man, I was, I was in, in the snooker hall, so I was a, a snooker player, billiard player, hustler, making a lot of money from 11 years of age to 18. Man, I was the up-and-coming star, but I, I, I used to play left-handed with people to trick them. Oh, that Vasilakis is not good. They oh, put 10 bucks on it. Then I play with my right hand and beat them. So I was a terrible swearer. You know, when the moment I came to Christ, when I came to Christ as a 17-year-old, instantly, my swearing was neutralised. It, it was like my, it was a, there was a clean-up that occurred. And it wasn't like I was trying not to swear. It was like my heart was now circumcised. And that part a foul language was cut out. And now the Holy Spirit was there. And so what's in there is going to come out. I still had to reprogram my mind because every so often I'd find myself, oh, that word must have come out. But there, didn't, there wasn't a lot of desire there anymore because the Holy Spirit's desires were taking over. So the, a circumcised heart and clean lips are linked. It's as simple as that. So church family, if we're going to be authentic and to live a godly, righteous lifestyle that reflects our right relationship with God, do you need some recircumcision of your inner life today? Are there things that you're saying that are reflective of what's going on on the inside? We're going to take communion today, and this is between God and you, and let the Holy Spirit take a scalpel and just cut that thing out of your heart. Yield it to him. If you know. Deal with it. My speech, what I say, my behaviour, what I do. Paul, again in Ephesians 4.1, says, as a prisoner for the Lord, because I'm in chains, guys. He's writing to the Ephesians. He's in Rome, in prison. I urge you, I plead with you, please live a life worthy of the calling you have received. He says, please, do everything within your power. God has called you to salvation. God has called you to be his child. God has called you 
to give your life to Christ and he circumcised your hearts. And that's why your speech is changing. Now your conduct, your behaviour, got to live worthily. And I continually ask Jesus to change my conduct. Even now, as an older man, to truly represent him and to reflect him. And um, none of us have it all together. You might say, well, you know, like my speech and my conduct are perfect. I'm sinless. I'm really. Is there anyone in that? Don't put your hand up. Nobody is sinless in this place. Okay? If, if you think you're sinless, that means you don't need Jesus, a saviour, and you don't need the Holy Spirit to help you. None of us have it together regarding. No one has perfect speech and perfect conduct. The point is we need forgiveness for our many sins, but we need empowerment in our inner lives. And Paul is saying your speech and your conduct can come under his control when you allow him to circumcise your heart, when you call upon him to enable you. Paul says that we're ambassadors. You know, ambassadors represent their governments. And... uh, they represent a higher authority. Do you know who the ambassador of uh, Australia's ambassador to the United States is? Anyone know? Out there, David Blaine, don't say. Philip Bryce, don't say. Who, who's the Australia's ambassador? He's done a fabulous job. He was Australia's treasurer in 2013-14. He's a rotund guy. He's always happy. Happy Joe Hockey. He's Australia's ambassador. He's been probably the best ambassador we've had for decades. You know why? Because in the 2016 election, all the press, all the commentators are going, man, Hillary's won it by Trump, this street fighter from New York. I mean, this wild boy whose philosophy is you you hit me once, I'm going to hit you three times back in Jesus' name. And everyone thought, there's no way he's going to win. Like, he's an entertainer. Like, he's a billionaire. He's... And, and Jahaki thinks to himself, hmm, I wonder whether I should make some reach out to the Trump organisation. So he calls upon Greg Norman, the famous ten- uh, tennis player, golfer, <laughs> one of Australia's best golfers, because he's a friend of Trump, because they're golfers. He says, Greg, can you introduce me to them? So he gets introduced to the Trump family and the Trump organisation, and, and, and Donald's really impressed that somebody wants to talk with him, that thinks he might win. So he welcomes the ambassador in. Well, have a guess what happens? They've become best of buddies. Do you know what's happened? Australia is in the good books with America. Economically, foreign affairs, anything we want, the Donald says, you can have it. What an ambassador. Because he represents you and me. We're the higher authority. We elect the government. So Australia's ambassadors as they're out there, don't represent themselves. They represent you and me. And so a good ambassador is smart. He doesn't get involved in the politics, whether he agrees with the political situation. He just says, okay, how can I get the best for my country? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.18 that we are Christ's ambassadors appealing to people to be reconciled to him. We say to people, there is a higher authority. His name is Jesus. He loves you. He died for you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to give you the gift of eternal life. He died on a cross to remove your sins. He rose again to assure you that there's a home in heaven, a gift of eternal life. And as ambassadors, we represent him. We we say to people, come on, get reconciled to him. You need him. So church, how effective an ambassador are you? In your behaviour, in what you do? Why well, are you embarrassed to tell people about your higher authority? Because maybe in your speech and in your conduct, you might think, oh, a little bit of inconsistency there. You imagine if Joe Hockey you did secret letters that were exposed saying Trump is this and the American government is that and was negative. I mean, like, Australia would be... We're not going to listen to you guys. So he was careful with his speech, with his behaviour, represented the higher authority, the people of Australia, so that the most powerful nation in the world economically will be of our benefit. If there's a crisis in foreign affairs, 
Crisis in defence, they're there to help us in, in our lives. He's a smart guy, a smart ambassador. So what about you? Are you a smart ambassador? Are you an effective ambassador? Do people look to you and say, man, that higher authority that you represent, I like. So my speech, my behaviour, my love, how I relate to others. Paul, Paul says to Timothy, tell them. And Ephesians says this, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Look at this wonderful verse. Follow God's example. As dearly loved children. You're dearly loved. And walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. To love like Jesus means living with a forgiving attitude. It means living with a giving disposition. It's what love to me means. Christian love means I, I, I become an, an offence-free zone. Quickly forgiving trespasses. And always endeavouring to give my best to another person. You know, the people who can hurt you the most are not strangers. Are not people who you casually know. They may say something to you or do something to you. Oh, well... That's their problem. You have no relationship with them. The person who can hurt you the most is the person that you love the most. The, person you, the, the, the issue of sin and offence that you struggle with is the offence that somebody causes who is close to you. A husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, a close friend. The Queen said this. She goes, where there's much love, there's also much hurt. Because the people that you love the most... Great statements because the people you love the most are the ones that can hurt you the most. They're the ones that can cause you a lot of pain. And Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, what? Forgive us our trespasses, our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. I looked after my little grandson for a couple of days while his dad was over in Sydney and his mum was over in Myanmar, little Josiah. So I'm saying, let's have some prayers. He goes, I want to do the Lord's Prayer. I go, all right. Every day, the Lord's Prayer, breakfast, lunch and tea. And he's memorised it. So I thought, oh, that's good. I said, I'll just teach him a little bit. I'll take a little phrase each time. So we focused on the offences one because that's big. <laughs> it's big for us too. You know, like, are you, a, do, do you have Velcro? Do you have a Velcro heart, a Velcro life where... See, if a Velcro life attracts all the dust, an offence, you keep it. Or are you coated with Teflon so the offence will come, bounces off you? Some of you are Velcro-hearted. And someone just looks at you the wrong way and you're offended. You've got conspiracy scenarios and you're basing your life on offences. Perceived offences are real offences. We're supposed to be Velcro, to be uh, Teflon coated, so that the offence will come just bounces off you. I'm amazed. Sometimes I, I, I've, 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 not recently, but I had people come say, you know, 10 years ago you offended me. I said, I did? 20 years ago, what did I do? And they tell me, I say, man, I don't even remember that. I said, did I? So I helped them, I said, look, I'm sorry. I don't remember it. But if I said it, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said it. Why? And I'm thinking, how do you live holding an offence for 10 years so that it eats you up? It's like, it's like drinking poison and hoping it's going to help hurt another person. To live in hatred, to live in resentment, to live in bitterness, to live in an offence mode destroys you. And uh, so to me... Here's the challenge. Do you attract offence or do you repel offence? The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, love each other deeply. Church community, love each other deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Do you have one blind eye and one deaf ear? If not, at the end of the service, I'll blind you and deafen you at least in one eye and one ear. Because you need it. You can't live life... And you can't stay married or have relationships with your kids or with people if forever you're looking for perfection. You offend me and man, you're going to cop it. 
You can't. You've got to live in forgiveness. So you see things, you say, oh, I saw that, but I didn't see it. Whoa. I heard that. Oh, I didn't hear that. I'm deaf on that one. If you want a relationship with your life partner or with any human being and you're forever focusing on their negatives or their mistakes, you will do a divorce. You can't stay related to a person like that. You've got to learn to forgive. You've got to learn to, to cover. You've got to, you've got to accept people's differences. You've got to cover their weaknesses. You've got to uh, um, forgive their trespasses and you've got to build trust. I'm going to write a book on that one too. Those four chapters, they're transformative. That's true. You've got to accept difference. You've got to cover weakness. You've got to forgive trespass. You've got to, to build trust. Otherwise, you can't live in this world. And so we love how I relate to others. So are you an offence machine? Or do you repel offences? Are you letting love control you so that it, it covers and neutralises a multitude of sins? My faith... How I reflect my trust in Jesus. Paul says to Timothy, son, because let people see the example of your faith. For, and look at the scripture in Ephesians. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from, from ourselves or from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. What a wonderful scripture. You see, my faith and trust in Jesus is totally grounded in grace. God's free unmerited favour on my behalf. It's by grace through faith. My faith and trust in Jesus is totally dependent on seeing it as a free gift. That's what it is. It's a gift of God. My faith and trust in Jesus is totally separate from my good works that I love to do for Jesus in appreciation for his saving grace. And so when you have an understanding of faith like this, there's no room for pride. Because if you think that you deserve the grace of God. If you think you're doing God a favour by serving him or by giving your life to him, you're greatly mistaken. You can do nothing of your own merits to earn salvation. All you can do is, is see a cross with a man hanging there and you get a glimpse that he's actually God in human form. Wow. And he could wipe out the earth and he says, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. You see love in action. You see God becoming a man and dying for me. Why? You see a dying thief who just calls out and says, Jesus, could you remember me when you come? He goes, son, you're saved. Even on the cross as he's dying, he's saving a man. Even on the cross, he's thinking of his mummy and he's saying to John, look after her. Look after her. He looks at his executioners and they're grubby, horrible people, murdering scoundrels who love killing and he, and he finds something in their favour. He goes, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's it. They're ignorant. They're dumbos. They're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. They knew what they were doing. They wouldn't do it. So he's able to, to well, what kind of man is this? Even the centurion said, surely this is God. And the centurion's heart is opened. The head of the execution squad's heart is open. A dying thief who's executed for, for his crimes is, is saved. This is... There's no room for pride. There's no room for... All, all one can say is thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's what faith is. Faith says thank you, I receive it. It's not a work. It's a gift. We receive the gift and we just say thank you to him. So is your faith based on your worth and your works or is it totally on his worth and his works on your behalf? Because Jesus is the author and the perfecter of your faith. You didn't commence your faith and you can't perfect your faith. The only way that you can, your, your faith can grow and, and it be a pure faith is if you fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12.2 says, we fix our eyes on Jesus for he is the author and the perfecter of our faith. There are times when our faith is so weak. There are times when our prayers are just like, we just pray and we think, oh man, I don't know if God hears them. And, and that. But Jesus hears them and he grabs them. They go to the throne of grace and he perfects them. You cry out to him in your weakness and think, oh, I have no strength. And then all of a sudden, power comes. 
as you admit your weakness and he makes you strong. He is the author and the perfecter of your faith. You can't heal yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't deliver yourself. You can't make yourself holy. Only he can. And, and we just say, we, we depend upon him totally. How I reflect my trust in Jesus. How are you doing it? To today around communion, do you need to, to say, Lord, there's some pride here. I think I'm, I need to understand that it's, it's all about not my worth and my works, but your worth and your works. And finally, my purity. How I deal with the old life patterns. And Paul says in Ephesians 4, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. You've got to say no to some things. To put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires. You have deceitful desires on the inside. It's called the sinful nature. It's the old life. And it stirs, has impulses, has desires. But uh, we've broken the engagement with that old boy, that old girl. We've broken the engagement. We're now engaged to another, Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit within us and he gives new desires and empowers us. But, uh, but we have to put off and say, look, I, I don't want to identify with the old. And he goes, how do you put on the new? Notice in verse 24, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and wholeness. The key, the bridge is to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Your mind bridges the old with the new. And we choose to align ourselves with the new, to change our thinking patterns. And the literal Greek means to be made new in the to be made new and youthful, to have a fresh, youthful, mental and spiritual attitude. Mind renewal is the bridge to walk across to the other side, to the promised land, to the new creation. That's why I wrote a whole chapter on this in The Me I Can Be about mind renewal is a bridge that takes you from the old to the new because your mind can remember the past. Shut your eyes. Yeah, I remember two years ago, five years ago, seven years ago. Okay, you, you can let that old empower you. You can think about sin. You can think about the old. You can think about the offences. Or you can say, ah, I'm a new creation. Heaven's my home. The Holy Spirit's in me. I have the promises of God that Tanya let us in. The yes and amen. Oh, yeah. So your mind's a bridge between the rotten stuff of the old and the wonderful stuff of the new. For you to get free and to live the abundant life that God has for you, for all the promises to be at work, your mind's got to be aligned with what God says about you in his word and what he's done for you through the work of the Spirit. So will you choose to put off some old things? Are there some old things that you're yielding to? Some old desires that you are pandering to? Some temptations that are coming and you think, oh, maybe I might just give in to that one. Or are you empowered through mind and you'll say, no, 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 the Holy Spirit's empowering me. He's helping me. He's enabling me. I spoke to a young woman just the other day and she's had some, I just said to her, I said, honey, I said, just say no. To the bad boys. So you're attracted to the bad boys. You love the bad boys. There's something in you that says, I like the bad boys. I said, you deserve better. You need a good boy. You need a man of God. I come to church. We've got fantastic men here. I'll, I'll get one for you. <laughs> I said, you've got to make a choice. You deserve better. God loves you. I love you. People love you. You deserve the best. Get rid of those bad boys. The bad boys are in your head. You get an image of a good boy. One who loves Jesus, loves his parents, works hard. He's not a bludger. He's going to support you. He's going to be faithful to you. He's not going to run off with somebody. Like, it's like it's a foreign language to her. It's like I'm assaulting her. Oh, oh, true. I said, yeah, it's true. I hope she'll never forget that talk. It took me 10 minutes, that's all. I gave it to her in Jesus' name. You deserve the best. I hope she'll never forget it. But you've got to make a choice. Will you choose to put off some of the old things and to put on the new things? So it gets me with all the stuff about drugs and drug testing and all this controversy. And so as people say, the governments and, and the authorities should say, no, 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 don't take drugs. 
Whether they decriminalise them so that people are not put in jail for, for taking it, I think the dealers should be put in jail, not the, the people who... A bit like prostitution. We should go the Swedish and Norwegian way. Is prosecute the men who go, not the girls who are usually on drugs and, and abused. The Norwegians and the Swedes, they just go, yeah, OK. You go to a brothel, we'll prosecute you. The girls are going to get off scot-free because they're usually drug addicts and they're usually abused. So we've got to think smarter, you know, like, but we've got to choose to, to put off some of these things and say, no, we're not going to, de going to legalise stuff that is hurtful to people, hurtful to society. Our kids need a clear voice saying, no, 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 we should not take drugs. No, 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 we shouldn't be going to brothels. No, we shouldn't be doing this stuff. There's certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong. And Paul is saying to Timothy, teach them, to, teach them in this corrupt society, this Artemis cult that's pervading the Ephesian context, because you've got to speak clearly.